I would like to call to order the Kaiser City Council in a work session. It is Monday, it is Monday, January 8th, 2024. Maybe if I thought the right one, that'd be better off. And ask our city recorder, please call roll. Councillor Reed? Here. Councillor Osman? Here. Councillor Kohler? Here. Mayor Clark? Here. Council President Starr? Here. Council Duran? Here. Councilor Cross? Uh, Councilor Cross is excused this evening. Youth Councilor Wittert? And he is also excused. Um, the work sessions are optional for our youth councilors. And th th uh, their teachers keep them really busy with like studies and things. I know, imagine that. Mm. So we have two items we're going to be working on this evening. Um, so the one to pull up right now is for the right-of-way ordinance, which will match what we're seeing on the screen. And uh, if we could, if we do turn down lights, just do it mildly, we need to be able to see to take notes. So maybe just a touch. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask Mr. Wood because I'm not allowed to touch those buttons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. Oh, Don. That's Don. I didn't see. I didn't see you over there, Don. All right. Okay, is that a good balance? You guys can see and we can see. No, not allowed. All right. And Mr. Brown. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. We're here to revisit the right of way ordinance. And uh, I'm going to start back where you all started, which was in December of 2021, when you had a uh, special counsel come and present, uh, Spencer Parsons from Beery Elsner and Hammond. And the bulk of the material that's in this presentation is from the letter, which should also be on your desk. And it's just put in this presentation. So uh, probably, if, most of you, this will seem extremely basic, but uh, that's where we wanted to start, is just kind of from ground level up. And um, just got a few extra slides. So here, let's just talk about where we've been. December 2021 is when the council first had a work session that talked about the merits of using a franchise model versus a right-of-way ordinance model. And after deliberation, the council directed staff to uh, proceed with making a right-of-way ordinance temp, uh, model or template. In June of six months later, June 21st of 2022, the uh, council voted to uh, award a procurement contract to draft that right-of-way ordinance with right-of-way consultants, LLC. And then uh, we had elections, and we have new council members in January of 2023. And the draft ordinance got to us uh, as in staff um, in, I want to say, the Feb February time frame. And uh, Shannon and I went uh, a couple of rounds back and forth with the uh, franchisees, trying to get some feedback that. and. Uh, eventually, as, eventually uh, on April 17th, the draft ordinance was uh, failed to get approval, but we contacted council and asked if you wanted to revisit it at some point, and um, nearly all of the council said, yes, we'd like to revisit it again. So uh, that's what brings us to this point of the discussion. So, from uh, just an economics perspective, I wanted to talk about what makes for good tax policy. And that this particular one applies to the user benefit principle. In other words, those who use it, uh, those who benefit from it, uh, pay for it. And they pay according to the usage of it. So if you pay more than, or if you use more, then you pay more for it. And so, I didn't want to use the term fair tax because there's there's some uh, political connotations about it, but if I can re uh, use those words in a sentence, I would say that it's arguably that's the most fair tax is one that's based on how much you use the uh, good. 
the opposite of that would be a, a redistributive uh, cost uh, where uh, people pay based on some other measure, but it isn't necessarily related to the uh, amount of usage that you have with a particular good or service. So we have right away uh, fees because the uh, these utilities and other companies, for-profit companies and and uh, not-for-profit companies use the public space, and it's not uh, just the city's space, it is the public space. They own all of the city's rights-of-way. So uh, there's inconveniences, they uh, reliance on the public domain to be able to make money, and there's a cost to that, it's wear and tear, uh, for all of us who've been uh, coming to City Hall every day for the last two or three weeks, there's been the curb cutting uh, just a couple blocks to the west of us, which we've had to route traffic uh, one way through. And when those uh, curb cuts and patches are done, then there's freeze thaw cycles and those cracks have to be sealed or uh, if they don't, then they start to tear apart and uh, the pavement gets what they call alligatored uh, in the breakup. And at that point, your whole uh, foundation is is uh, spent. So there's a wear and tear. There, uh, I found a video. It's really, you know, hard to find public information on a lot of things and. This is admittedly something that as governments we're not very good at because uh, that we, we sort of take advantage of the fact that we have a monopoly on what most of what we do so we don't have to educate as much but when we really should. Uh, so trying to find a good example of education of this uh, is, was difficult but there was a video that I found on uh, Oregon City, City of Oregon City's page but it was done by the city of Eugene 10 years ago. And I thought it's, it's a really well done video that I thought would play. And again, this is really basic, probably stuff that you all understand, but um, for the benefit of the recording, I think it's a, a good information. Every day, we make use of our streets and public rights of way, though most folks don't give it a lot of thought. But like the airwaves used by radio and TV, the streets and public rights of way in our cities belong not to any one person, but to all of us. Our publicly owned streets and rights of way are primarily managed and maintained on behalf of all users by Oregon local governments. Our streets and rights of way surround and connect us. Each of us uses this unique resource when we go to work, access goods or services, pick up our kids from school, or visit family and friends. We use utility networks in our rights of way to cook our food and heat our homes. Besides water, plumbing, and electricity, our streets also host critical pathways to phones, computers, televisions, and the global internet. Whether the connections are wired or wireless, commercial businesses depend on the people's property to deliver connections that allow us to stay in touch with each other and the world. We also depend on our streets and property to keep us safe, healthy, and free from harm. 
Of course, keeping streets in good repair isn't free. There's a cost for maintaining all of this, not to mention coordinating the work of many different users to minimize the headaches for us all. Not only does it cost money to keep the public right of way accessible and useful for everyone, but many of the users are private companies, for-profit companies who pay rent to we the people in various forms, primarily to Oregon local governments. The streets and rights of way are our collective property as taxpayers, right? Since the public is the ultimate landlord, cities manage the people's property on the public's behalf. After all, it wouldn't be very responsible to let private companies use our streets for free, would it? Charging rent for use of public facilities by private people is nothing new here in Oregon. For years we've been doing this, been managing it because under the Oregon Constitution of Home Rule, also under city charters and state law, we are charged with managing the public's right of way. You know, the voters expect us to make sure that they get a proper return for the use of their publicly owned right of ways, and that's what we do. Fortunately, our partners in federal and state government have long understood the importance of ensuring rent is paid for public property and many federal statutes reinforce this critical principle. Federal funds were used to map out the Oregon Trail. In other words, management of our public right-of-ways started with our early pioneers to ensure transportation network benefited everyone, not just our commercial interests. What was once a dirt track now includes essential services, water, sewer, gas, and communications. Internet access is our newest essential service, connecting us to jobs, education, and health. Cities must ensure that this critical service is as available as other essential services are using public rights of way. It takes a lot of planning to make sure that when work is done on one part of the street, it creates as little impact as possible on all the other uses and users. And care must be taken to assure all service needs are met equally and fairly. These services need maintenance, repairs, and additions. More and more wires, pipes, and cables are being added to our right of way to meet the needs of ever-changing technology. Even wireless phones now increasingly need right of way antennas and facilities to connect to backhaul landlines. All of this has to be handled and coordinated with as little disruption to traffic and businesses as possible. Municipalities must also respond to safety issues. In any construction project, access for emergency vehicles needs to be planned. These additions and repairs to the right-of-way are happening all the time. The number of requests for construction permits has increased dramatically, and yet the fee structure has not changed hardly at all. Oregon communities are very different from each other. That's why a construction schedule for Nehalem might not work in Beaverton at all. Wait, did we mention that none of this is free? If each company had to spend the time and money to find space to lay their pipes, wires, and cables, the cost of providing their services would increase considerably. This compensation may take different forms depending on the community, but all of it is returned to the ultimate owner, the public, in the form of critical municipal services such as police, fire, parks, and street repairs. Every so often there are proposals to cut back Oregon right-of-way fees or change the law to make one size fit all in distinctly different Oregon communities. What works in Portland may not work well here in Cottage Grove. We have to keep the faith of the citizens and taxpayers and make sure that both the right-of-ways are protected for all users and that the public is fairly compensated. After all, the streets and rights-of-way in Oregon belong to everyone. And it's the bring a smile to some of your faces who recognize some of the people in the, the videos. Uh, there's a, a few of my friends in the videos too. Uh, all right, so um, this will be in the minutes and that link will be out there and um, maybe we can push that out. 
on our uh, social media channels for education since it's out there in the public domain. Okay, so getting into the meat of the letter that you, uh, the council received in 2021, I'm just going to try to go over this. The franchise is an agreement between the government and a company for the use of that space. And uh, like was pointed out in the video, if the public right-of-way was not accessible and let's say I, um electric company or a cable company had to purchase easements from individual property owners, it would be extraordinarily expensive. So using the public right of way is uh, the most economical means for most of these companies to deliver services. The traditional way we've done that is through franchise agreements. The alternative to that, which is a newer trend, is uh, by ordinance or by city law, which would uh, require any providers to get licenses instead of an agreement. A utility rights away ordinance is a tool used uh, by increasingly a number of cities. Uh, Oregon City has passed a right away ordinance, West Lynn, Clackamas County, Hillsboro, uh, to name a few. and. Its intent is to replace the franchise agreements, but uh, we're seeing some examples where uh, there's both franchise agreements and ordinances make sense. So I'll address that in a little bit. So first I wanna talk about some of the uh, limitations and benefits of franchise, franchise agreements, and then we'll kind of go into some of the limitations of the right-of-way ordinance try to give you a, a fair uh, representation of both. So one of the challenges with franchise agreements is that it limits the city's ability to make regulations that become effective immediately. Uh, most, since the terms are agreed upon in the franchise agreement, if the city wants to make changes, procedural or uh, in the way we regulate them, it typically has to be done at the new, in a new contract. So if it's a 10-year franchise agreement and we have changes that come up now or five years into it, we have to wait till the end of the agreements. And uh, they have to be negotiated to be uh, mutually agreed upon. So just graphically, you know, um, I see things, I, I like to see things visually, so just looking at utility A, B, C, and D here, they're all, their uh, franchise agreements all expire at different times and at different periods during that 11-year uh, time period. We have different procedural changes that need to be made, but we can't bring them on all at the same time. We have to bring them on separate as each agreement expires and gets renewed. So one of the uh, arguments about franchise agreements is that we have some paying and some that are not paying. Uh, we have these franchise agreements with Northwest Natural Gas, Portland General Electric, Salem Electric, Comcast, CenturyLink, and our, in, our enterprise funds, water and sewer, pay the franchise fee also because they're doing business in the cities right away. Uh, not paying is what we have a lot of free riders in the system and mostly the attorney identified them as the telecom industry, but also uh, competitive cable providers and uh, competitive electric suppliers. And this is something I just learned me sitting down with some of our utilities with that we have franchise agreements with. Larger big box corporations in our community. Um, I'll use one that's not in our community as an example, and then you can extrapolate it to ones that are. But for instance, uh, Walmart 
is a large corporation. Because of the size of that corporation uh, aggregated, they are allowed to buy energy on the private market, not from, they don't have to buy all their energy from PGE or Salem Electric. So they are paying the franchise fee just for the transmission cost through PGE or Salem Electric, and they're not paying the fan franchise fee on their um, actual electric cost. So this is, again, as learned from our uh, electric providers, and they said they'd be interested in helping us to identify those free riders. Just a quick question with that. So you talk about retailers. Is that also true of uh, large um, industrial or commercial mm -hmm. ventures as well as the specific to retail corporations? Um, it's a good question. I don't know the line of demarcation of when they're allowed to provide, when they're allowed to buy on the private market or when they have to. But I su suppose there's, we'll find that out at what point, at what energy usage they are required to buy from the provider, and when they get to a certain point, they're allowed to go on the open market. Because I think, in, uh, just as a follow-up, um, in Primeville, because of the huge energy usage by the uh, data farms that they have there, they actually run it through a city utility. So that's part of the deal that they work out uh, for them, but they, they made that very specific for the development of that land and so forth, but it doesn't sound like that's universal. Possibly. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we keep going? Okay. Back to you. Okay, and um, so those who are, one of the things the federal law says is you can't uh, make a competitive disadvantage to a business because of the uh, franchise fee. So we have paying customers, uh, paying utilities that are put at a competitive disadvantage because their costs increase, and the ones not paying are at a competitive advantage because they aren't paying. They don't have to add that to their fee. So uh, this right away, a right away ordinance would put everybody on an evil or a <laughs> equal playing field, all paying the same uh, fee set by ordinance. Conformity is another reason uh, through permitting, uh, rest restoration relocation requirements, meaning the, how we re repair the road. If uh, standards change during a term of a franchise, the, of how we require the road to be rebuilt, then that's something that would have to be mutually agreed upon. Uh, if it was mid-contract or renegotiated at the end. Insurance requirements, bonding, and the payment of a privilege tax. Privilege tax, again, being the right to do work on the public's domain. Um, compensation for equally across utilities that use the city's right-of-way. And of course, there's there's time and effort. We use special counsel to negotiate the contracts, so there's time and effort to uh, do that as each one expires and we have to renegotiate them. Okay, so let's switch sides of the argument and take a different point of view. And this would be the commonly argued disadvantages of right-of-way ordinances, so maybe a case for franchise fees. Uh, there's a perception that's a new tax because if there are free riders, then they are uh, not paying a franchise fee. If that is imposed on them, then uh, as, some, as it came up in the discussion we had six months ago, they, somebody might see a new charge on their cell phone bill or um, whatever other alternative cable provider. So uh, it's not only perceived, but yes, it, it would. In fact, uh, people would see that as a new cost. And that goes back to the user benefit principle. Is do we think it's fair that those who use more should pay more, or do we see it as a redistribution? Uh, 
Um, one of the arguments is that in your franchise agreements, you have a built-in uh, dispute resolution processes, and uh, that's maybe a little more challenging to do in, by ordinance, but not uh, necessarily impossible. But those, um, the defense against legal challenges is one cited reason why uh, right away ordinance might be weaker than a franchise agreement. And uh, this is really similar to the other one, but the city would be giving up certain breach of contract remedies if the license is not considered an agreement. Another one is that cable operators are governed, governed uh, by federal law, which requires a franchise fee, so, and the cities must comply. So we know, regardless, even if we do go the route of a right-of-way ordinance, we would still have to have a franchise agreement with a cable provider. Um, another argument was there's uh, time spent up front, uh, although having a draft, uh, much of that work is behind us. But um, you know, there's definitely there's time either spent negotiating all the individual franchise agreements or time creating a ordinance that tries to address everything, which is challenging. Um, this is something we heard, uh, it, it actually isn't in the letter from the attorney back in 2021, but it's something we heard from the franchisees. And what they like is certainty. Uh, uh, they understand their obligations for the term of the franchise and they can make plans and financial um, forecasts based on those. It ensures that the procedural requirements that we have won't change uh, without their mutual consent. So like any business, the more of uh, certainty involved, uh, generally we like that, not only in business, but in, in our government too. Councilor Cole has a question. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, City Manager Brown, um, so once we have a franchise agreement, can we not make am amendments to it? We can make amendments to it, but they have to be mutually agreed upon since it's an agreement. So it's like renegotiating the contract in the middle of the, the road. Right, yeah, and any time you open up a contract, then the whole contract is... So there would need to be some pretty legitimate reason to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, typically, you have to find an interest on both sides. Uh, you know, One-sided bargaining is, is always difficult. I have another question. Follow up? Uh, it's not related to that one exactly, but you talked about the, the user benefit principle where those that use the right away uh, things would be paying for it mm. versus a redistribute cost. So like the, the parks fee is kind of like a redistribute cost. Yes. It's not everybody uses the park. Yep. Okay, thank yep. you. Yep. As our police. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. When you need it, yep, that's the difference. So, um, this is just a chart where I'm trying to put all these forces, driving forces and restraining forces against it, and you kind of have to kind of weigh them. I, I tried to proportion, this is not scientific, but I tried to, uh, some of these are more important to them. Perception is a big, uh, is very strong restraining forces. Uh, a driving force for the city uniformity and trying to get all of our utility providers under the same language and stuff is a, a driving or force. So some of these are more important, some of these are less important. The length of these bars is non-scientific, very, the touch of my mouse. So. so back then, the special counsel said, 
On balance, this office generally recommends adoption of a right-of-way ordinance as a more effective and efficient tool to ensure fair and equal access to and use of the right-of-way, as well as ensuring the city receives reasonable compensation for such use from all users. That was their recommendation then. So um, we have been looking at it as a one side or the other, doing a, a franchise or a right of way ordinance. And uh, in speaking with the utility providers, one option that they put out there was an and option a franchise fee, a franchise agreement and something that wraps up everything else and ties up all the other loose ends, encompasses all others. So uh, where we ended up, the draft of the ordinance took a long time to write. Um, our franchisees did not feel that there was adequate uh, back and forth between the city and our organizations, our organization. Uh, the policy issue crossed councils, uh, which I think was important uh, because it was, you know, some of you weren't there at the original decision was made, and so that makes it challenging. And then lastly, this and course, uh, franchise and an ordinance, uh, really wasn't uh, explored, um, at least at the time I was here for this, this part of it. No. It may have been before I got here. So what we're recommending is that we continue to look at this and option, uh, a franchise agreements, which you give an instruction to go ahead and renegotiate the ones that are expiring in the next five months. We also, though, work with utilities to get feedback on uh, the current form of the right-of-way ordinance and look at what other communities that have already done this. Uh, Hillsborough, for example, has done this and solution, franchise agreements and right-of-way ordinance. And so I'd love to go meet with them and talk about you know what their reasonings were and, and look at their template, well, how their model and how it's working for them. And um, again, so spend more time with the uh, franchisees, talk with, talking with them and getting their feedback. So I think that is the end of the slides. I know I'm always one PowerPoint slide from greatness. <laughs> All right. Um, turn that back to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, at our last council meeting, when we were discussing uh, franchising, and we had uh, PGE, Cellmetric, and um, a Northwest Natural uh, representation here, talked about the and option. And uh, tonight is to help us to uh, start to wrap our heads around what this is gonna look like going forward, and a framework for engaging with um, our current uh, utilities, the ones that are the ones that were here last Monday, the ones that um, like Comcast that have some specialties, and to build a framework where we understand how this is working and where the opportunities are and how we can be adaptive going forward as technology continues to evolve. And I think that's where uh, some of this opportunity for the and appears to be um, an opportunity, especially with uh, Hillsboro. And uh, are there other options um, that have gone to an and out there? That was the one they cited, but I, 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 could, I would talk to Wendy. She was, seemed to be knowledgeable about mm -hmm. the ones that had gone there. Yeah, I think she was involved in a lot of those. Mm. So that would be fantastic. Questions or comments? So I'm gonna just, I have a list. Do you have a list? We'll just kind of go down the line. Okay, so Councilor Reed, anything? Uh, not at the moment, no. Okay, Councilor Hausman? A single question, Madam Mayor. Mr. Brown, Best I understand as far as whom the city would be negotiating with on these uh, franchises or within a right-of-way framework. Uh, 
we have a lot of the large publicly traded corporations, Northwest Natural, PG, Comcast, Verizon, so on and so forth. Large corporations are large corporations are large corporations are large corporations, right? They all, <laughs> they have their fundamental differences in the service that they operate, but in some ways because of their size and their heft, we have an idea of how to play with them. Salem Electric strikes me as the biggest outlier because of its cooperative framework. Are there any other partners with whom their business framework and their size, because we know Salem Electric's not a major player in at the same size and scale as PGE. Any of those other entities come to mind when thinking about pursuing this and model here? You're, you're right, Salem Electric has that cooperative model is uh, unique. I, you know, there, there was another um, on the east side of the state, another cooperative uh, internet provider, uh, Farmers Co-op. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if they were there when Councilor Kohler was on that side of the state or not, but uh, they were fairly big uh, telecom co-op. But I don't know, did any, any of them come to your mind, uh, Attorney Johnson? Okay, no, I, I appreciate at, that. Just, um, they, they strike me as the only immediate outlier as far as right. if we're exploring the and option, whom we may be attending to with a little bit greater care. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to call that out. Yeah. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. And um, last Monday, Salemetric and PGE representation were here for the conversation side by side. Councilor Kohler, anything? No. Thank you. Council President Starr? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just out of curiosity, did were PGE just out of recognition that they felt like they there wasn't a lot of um, engagement with them in the process last time? Um, were any of the I'll call them the big three um, that I'm familiar with PGE, Northwest Natural, or Salem Electric were they invited to be here tonight to participate? If we had any questions. Um, I did, we did, when I met with them, maybe about a month ago, um, I did tell them we had this work session and uh, they, and then I communicated back with them because I was contemplating taking that request from last week on the 18th of December. And uh, I felt it was rushed and, and often when I do that, it, it, things don't turn out well. So. I decided to wait until the first meeting in January. So I contacted them. I said, I know this is just a week before we do our work session about it, but we're still going to take it to them and uh, take it to the city council to be able to move forward with your franchise agreement. So they knew that we were talking about it tonight. Okay. I, I mean, I did, but like officially, they knew we were talking about it, but I'm just curious if there was an official invite to be here in case we had any questions for Wendy since she's been involved in it. Just like, did we officially say, hey. They didn't get a card from me. It, it's not about a card, it's, <laughs> but it's like there's a difference between saying we're having a work session and you're invited to attend and we'd like. Yeah, it, it would be fair to say I didn't, okay. I didn't say, hey, please come. Okay. That'd be fair. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson had. Well, I, I was just going to say that if the result last week had been different, they would have been here, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, but so we, we didn't think about inviting them as a resource. I think that their concerns are kind of resolved. So otherwise, I think they would have. Been. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we heard that the, the agreement time frame on the franchise agreements is 10 years. Like, where is that from? Is it just because that's what we've always done? Because that's not one of my favorite phrases. Um, and so I'm just curious if there's issues with things potentially coming up in the middle, you know, the offset um, changes that we make in one, but we can't make in another because it's 10 years. Why 10 years? That's historic precedence. So it's what we've always done. I was trying not to I say caught that. you. Yeah. Um, but I think there perhaps is some ways that we can address that in the franchise agreements. 
it, it may be more challenging, but to say if, you know, we, in the language, we might be able to say if there are the new standards that are um, made in the right-of-way ordinance for uh, restoration that the, um, the franchise agreement recognizes the city's right to do that. I, mean, I think we can try to address some of those issues. So kind of as a follow-up to that, what are some of the examples of potential changes that might come up in the middle of a franchise agreement that we would want to change, but we can't because it was 10 years old or mm -hmm. 10 years long? Yeah, so uh, like a streetscape might be something that would might change it. Uh, the And uh, the, let's see, our engineers come up with a new road base uh, standard that changes um, not very often, fortunately, but let's say they uh, come up with we need 10 inches of base instead of um, eight inches. And that's the type of thing, the restoration and rebuild standards that uh, were cited in the letter from 2021. Um, okay, I'm just gonna keep going. Is that okay? Follow up. My list, thank you. Um, I'm assuming that when we say telecom, um, because we have CenturyLink that is on the paying franchise and they're telecom, um, same with Comcast, they provide phone. What else is considered in telecom? Would that be like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile? Uh, yeah, those certainly would be. Um, there's another one that is has approached us that is making uh, progress up through Salem, we call it Zipply Fiber. And they've been um, burning up Shannon and his phone line and email. Uh, and they're, so they're putting uh, fiber in the ground. I interesting, a lot of your uh, cable providers like Comcast, Xfinity, they may have a fiber to a box in the neighborhood, but yet you're still getting a coax line so it's being throttled down uh, to the house so but some of these uh, providers now are option alternatives to cable and internet and uh, telephone are going uh, to the house with fiber especially in new developments it's, it's a it's an easy change but uh, retrofitting is expensive Thank you. You, um, at, you mentioned in your presentation that there's costing for the negotiating of the franchise fee agreements. What is the, co like, that's a great, you know, yes, we know there's a cost, but what is that? Because that's kind of a vague statement. Um, I, Mr. Johnson, do you know how much we spent on attorney fees in the past to negotiate in a contract? No. Um, order of magnitude? Or? No. Unfortunately, the only ones that I was involved in when I came in-house were the gas and electric. And at that point, um, I, did not, I did not engage outside counsel. Uh, moving forward, we are, because um, I just kind of want to be careful if we're going to be stuck for 10 years and have somebody with a little more expertise. But I don't have an answer for the question about what the cost would be. I can try to get that. Yeah, I, hourly, the cost mm -hmm. is three to four hundred dollars an hour. Yeah, how many? I mean, then it would be how many hours? Right. So I'll, I'll try to get that. Thank you. Um, what is, you talked about uncertainty with the row um, ordinance. Can we get examples of what that uncertain, those uncertainties are? Um, if I can, I think from the provider's point of view, with a franchise ordinance, both sides are locked in. And, and by the way, with regard to the 10 years, although that is tradition, I can, I can take a pretty good guess at that. Um, the, f there's no way I would, if, from the city's point of view, I would prefer to go five. From the provider's point of view, they would probably like to go 20, because once they lock something in, there, there's more likelihood that we would change something than they would. Um, but um, back to the issue of the... Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? I got sidetracked on myself. Uh, what is the, un <laughs> you, in the presentation, that it listed uncertainties. Oh, right. What are the examples of that? Yeah, so the uncertainties is, is from the provider's point of view. From the provider's point of view, the, they're wondering, well, gee, you have an ordinance, it's unilateral, it's one-sided, are you going to make a change in that next year or five years from now? 
unlike a franchise where we couldn't make a change. So I think that's the uncertainties from their side. And the last one for now. I think Adam has a follow-up. I think I may have a good example, though. Um, a big issue for them is undergrounding of cable. Uh, or And so there's, in the current franchise agreement, I think there's, there's conditions in which they have to underground it. But if we were able to, if we had to say, very you know, everything now has to be underground and that would maybe a change to what's in the current agreement. So that would be a, probably the best example. I think. Okay, thank you. Um, and my last one for now. Um, why, it, curious, when we had that contractor, that consultant who specialized in right of way, I'm curious why the and wasn't brought up then. It, they were an expert consultant. It, it was brought up. The, the issue is um, once you start to let providers um, go to franchise, the ones who aren't going to franchise are going to point to that. And then, you know, if you're trying to do a right-of-way model, if you don't have anybody under the right-of-way model because they're all the franchise, you've defeated your purpose. Frankly, I think that this, at least with regard to um, what I'll just call the traditional uh, providers, the gas and electric, this makes some sense to have a franchise. That's what they're used to. They're pushing very hard for it. I don't think it, I, I think other types of non-gas and electric utilities are going to have a difficulty saying, well, gee, you know, we should get that too because they're, you know, gas and electric got it. Well, you're t those are totally different. But if you start going to even more um, than that, then you're going to have a question of how many are going to left, be left under the right-of-way ordinance. So back to your point, it was discussed. Uh, we discussed that with our consultant and our outside counsel, um, but you know that wasn't the recommendation. Okay, because I don't. That that, that issue maybe came my up. My memory is foggy, but I don't well, recall that being a you, big discussion. No, here. you are you are correct about that. That wasn't a big discussion, but that issue was raised during the during the two or three council meetings we had. It just was not a big discussion item. That's all. Okay, but it's what I'm hearing is it's a now it's coming back as a recommendation or something to look at. Yeah, yeah and that came from um, Wendy. Wendy from PGE, and it, it was just upon the uh, completion of Hillsborough doing it. So it was kind of a fresh example of okay. it. And I think th there may be some demarcation that we're able to do with uh, utilities that have set public service areas um, and maybe at some governance of the Public Utilities Commission so I think there may be some parameters we're able to set about these ones are able to do a franchise <coughs> franchise as well. All the others will fall under a right of way ordinance. But great questions. Councillor Joyan. Well, my question was pretty much already taken up, but I, okay. I want to expand a little bit. Um, <laughs> is there a possibility to do a you know in the in a shorter franchise agreement? you know, five year or less for this particular time frame. Um, is there a way to, to put in there something based on um, changes to the row ordinance? So the, the right of way ordinance. Mm -hmm. I mean, can we, can we do something that says, you know, here's the franchise agreement, but as the right of way ordinance is developed, mm -hmm. things could change. That, that was just my thought is, you know, we can tie it, tie it to it since we're developing it right now. I know that would be, might be difficult, but I just thought I'd ask if that could be something we, we include in our right of way or the franchise agreements. We, we can certainly ask for that. But one of the, the flip side of the coin with the franchisee question, of course, is they got to agree. So um, a lot of the times that's why you see these franchise negotiations go on and on. Because one side, you know, there's there's a bit of an impasse on one or two issues, and you just don't you don't never move forward until you re, you know re, reach a resolution to that. But we certainly can ask. One of the issues that I think we would push for clearly would be if there's anything in the right of way ordinance that is clearly not addressed one way or the other in the franchise, which I, I, I doubt would happen, by the way, because they're very thorough. 
but if that would happen, that the franchise ordinance, excuse me, the right-of-way ordinance would apply. That might be one avenue. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to Councilor Reed. Who had a question? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, mine is perhaps uh, a, a bit of a pedantic clarification, but um, I heard uh, in, in uh, Tuesday's meeting that it was industry standard. I just want to cl clarify if it was industry standard or Kaiser, this uh, Kaiser tradition. So, I, for, for the ten years, yes, I, I've I've seen that. I think that's fairly common. I don't I don't think that that's unique to Kaiser. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that it wasn't just because we've always done it, but it was an industry standard, which is slightly different, I think. So anyway, again, perhaps pedantic, but I think important. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things that um, I heard, just to make sure I heard them correctly, is that as we are moving forward, there's the opportunity to look at the different types of uh, businesses that are operating in our rights of way and to develop a better understanding of which ones, um, and I like the delineation, the ones that are, um, uh, that have a set service area versus the, that that does not. The ones that are governed by the Public Utility Commission and those that are not. I think there's a, those are maybe two of the delineations to help us uh, frame the conversation about which ones operate better from the and again, we're looking at it from the lens of what is in the best interest of the people of Kaiser. This is the, we all own this land. How is it going to be best managed for the benefit of the people of Kaiser? And which ones are governed this way, which ones are governed that way? And I think that will make us more adaptive because um, how many of us have seen the changes in our technology and service delivery over the last 15, 20 years that has been very significant will make us more adaptive for the uh, changes in technology that will come down the pipeline or airwaves or however it travels um, in the future. So I'm looking forward to framing the conversation that way to understand the, the yins and the yangs that go into what the structure is going to look like, learning from other or jurisdictions um, that have developed some successful AND models and then we can look at it from the Kaiser point of view of what do we have here, how are we going to manage our rights of way so that they can be equitable, accessible. And I also, um, Ian, I think all of our agreements, we have something that if they're going to tear up our right of way uh, for any sort of um, repairs and so forth, I know Mr. Lawyer is diligent to get a hold of them when we're working on the road. If you're going to go underground, you better be doing it now, because if I just pave this and you come and dig it up, we're going to be having some words and they're not going to be pretty. Something or something to that effect <laughs> um, to preserve the, um, the right of way for the people of Kaiser and save everybody a whole lot of money. And I think that's been a, uh, a point of efficiency that has been built in with our uh, Public Works Department for a very long time. So I don't know if everybody else follows our example, but they should. Um, so those are a couple of things I heard. Um, the adaptive to do new technology. Um, so if I miss something, uh, please chime in on some of the elements that we believe should be part of the framework for conversation. Did you have another question, Council President Starr? I saw your, I saw you wrote something down. I said for now earlier. Um, have we tried to get franchise agreements with like Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T? I'm just curious why they've not been franchised before. And if you've told me before, I'm sorry, I forgot. I, I haven't told you that because I'm pretty new to this discussion, but it um, looked like something was crossing um, Attorney Johnson's mind. About it. Well, with... With regard to actual landline connections, no, because that not that I'm aware of that those big operators operate actual landlines. It's the cell company operation. So with regard to AT&T and um, Verizon, T-Mobile, uh, none of those operators actually own lines in the road we would have to change the law. They're, they're not required right now unless you adopt a right-of-way ordinance. Uh, they wouldn't be required to, to do a franchise. They don't have lines in the road. 
With regard to some of the ones that M Mr. Brown was talking about, um, there's an, uh, the electric ones called Calpine that sell to um, big developers. They w are willing to enter into a franchise. Our consultant um, has checked with them, and they'd be willing to pay us under a right-of-way ordinance. Um, and if we don't adopt a right-of-way ordinance, we'll be talking to them about entering into a franchise. Uh, and that would be true for any other smaller um, landline companies. There's some, well, as Mr. Brown indicated, Zipply. I think there's, I think New Wave might still be operating, I'm not sure, but there are some smaller landline fiber companies, and we would have the right to, and we would, approach them about entering into franchises. Uh, the, then that's why we were at that point a couple of years ago, because we didn't do the right-of-way ordinance, then it's like, well, we should approach them about franchise. But again, those wouldn't affect Verizon and ATT as, as cell companies. So who would, who are they, who's paying the space that the AT&T cell phone companies of the world or the Verizon and T-Mobile of the world, who's paying for the space that they're using? So, and, and I don't have to preface this remark because it's a little bit of a guess, but Verizon and AT&T, T-Mobile, the cell companies, use those landlines, and I would expect would pay um, CenturyLink, or maybe they use Comcast lines, I'm not sure how that works, for the wholesale use of that. We may get a fraction of that fraction. We do not have it based on, like all the other franchise agreements, the actual based on the user amount. So you can see the 5% is a fraction of that because it's not getting the actual bill that the customer would get, if you see where I'm going. Yeah, and I have one more follow-up. Thank Counselor. you. Where, so you mentioned the Walmarts of the world um, purchase energy from the open market. If I And I'm going to need a work session on the open market energy world because I that's new to me. Um, kind of kidding. Um, but where would those non-paying providers of that energy fall? Would they fall under the new right-of-way ordinance? Yes, they would. They would need um, a license under the right-of-way ordinance. The uh, privatization of energy is, isn't um, new, but it is new. Um, it's not available here to you and I, but when I was uh, in another state and the state deregulated uh, energy, then all of a sudden you have these energy providers uh, calling you and say, hey, I can sell it to you at this rate, this rate, and lock it in. And it was variable with the person or the provider that uh, had the transmission lines. So they would lock you in a rate, and you know we took advantage of that. You pay a fee to the main company, energy company, that has all the transmission lines, and then my then it would show on my bill the provider that I had chosen so there's uh, it would be any any entity that's um, producing energy and putting it on the grid they could sell a uh, counselor Johnson said at whole wholesale but they would then fall under the new right of mm -hmm. if we did the and model yeah thank you and I was um, there was Examples, I've seen a lot of those um, telecom providers use, um, I, I think it's fine to use this, this company as a, um, there's uh, LS Networks is, is one company that I worked with on the other side of the state and they are on this side of the state too. Uh, they are, their salesman told me they really, the highway of traffic, so they're focused on providing the um, high bandwidth, long stretch uh, fiber, and they're gonna pass a lot of customers in between. They would, uh, in order to sell to the T-Mobiles, AT&Ts, and the Verizons. And so they uh, had started looking at some of the bigger customers that they were passing underneath, saying, hey, you know, they're, uh, 
of the school district, the college, the city, or big users. Why, why don't you know? Why don't we get them as customers too, rather than just being the super highway for the information? Thank you. And one of the things, um, and to your point, Council President Starr, um, to hear from PGE and from Salem Electric is that um, when we discussed this a while back, they are required to carry the energy on their lines, but they cannot, um, mm -hmm. they can't control that, and they would not, they'd be very open to this conversation to level the playing field, let's put it that way, and I think they can better inform us on what these models look like under the current regulations, uh, no pun intended, and uh, what this could look like for an AND model that would uh, be more equitable for you know, all the users in the right of way. Right, and this is gonna be for the framework for further conversations. So this is to get everybody back to, back to ground zero, if we will, uh, to understand what we're gonna be talking about here. From here, um, I believe we'll be working to put together the series of uh, work sessions, conversations with our providers, but uh, to come back with um, additional uh, information on what this can look like and um, how those conversations will be structured going forward. So I think that was the purpose for this evening, to make sure that we're all clear about what we're talking about and the questions that we have so that our staff members and our um, utility partners can help inform what this conversation is going to look like. That's what, how I understood it. And then we'll from, proceed from here probably with the additional follow-up work sessions or, um, and or, and, uh, once we get further along with the model, then we'll have the open houses and uh, public uh, conversation about what this looks like going forward, is how I envision what we're, how we will proceed from here. Does anybody have a different or some add-ons to that? Okay, we're good to go forward. Mr. Brown, Mr. Wood, Mr. Johnson. Well, I know you're, you're counting down, but you're gonna pass everything to uh, Mr. Lindsay. Okay, who can listen to the tape? I can. That's right, and he will. <laughs> All right, fantastic. All right. Um, okay, so we've been at this for now. We're gonna about to make a big shift. Can we take a couple minutes to, to brain shift and then sit back down uh, for a completely different, and now for something completely different. So let's go into recess for five minutes.
Oh, good Lord. That's my experience, Charlie. Give me a break. It's January 8th. Unitas is on it, man. Unitas, okay. Uh, got my mortgage interest statement. Oh, you know what? I think I did. I don't know if it was an actual email or if it just popped up on the web page when I checked my bank account, but got the same thing. Well, I don't know if some of these places are starting to not send a paper version. Yeah, that's, that's what's yeah, happening. That's the case with them. Well, they it's damn well better be sending a specific <laughs> email now. But you know how easy you can overlook that. <laughs> My main headache is my last <laughs> year or two. In addition to ourselves, I'm now doing that for my mother-in-law. Now, she has an accountant, but I still have to get these things, and they get lost, and they have to try to get duplicates. I've been doing my parents and both of my brothers for years. Both of your brothers? And I just quit doing my brothers a couple, maybe a year or two ago. I was doing my mother's, too. Wait a minute. <laughs> their, their taxes? Uh-huh. Not just gathering. No, doing the actual tax return. Do you have some tax background that no. I don't know about? I do have a, a um, tax preparer working with me, though. <laughs> She's not in anymore. Oh. I, I am not a very organized person. So, yeah, I told you the joke, what my wife said when we got a little argument about the organization at home. You didn't hear anything. We had a little dis disagreement because we're both messy and disorganized people. You die when you're both like that. And we got a little <laughs> discussion about it. She goes, well, I don't have Tammy around me. <laughs> so there. <laughs> yeah. But because you think my office looks bad now, you should see if Tammy was around. But, um... It does work better when you have one of you. One of you, yeah. But what I, oh, what I was going to say is I'm not very organized, but I, I, my accountant sends me a worksheet. I should have it any day now. I said, very early in January. It's a great big folder. It's still paper. Hopefully it's not going to be paper. And I put that up kind of on the file, top of the file cabinet, and I don't let my wife check the mail. I mean, I literally don't. I go right in there. Oh, yeah. Right in the worksheet. The, the yeah. tax folder. I have my tax folder too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did it for years because one or both of us were always self-employed. I mean, that's my. I mean, that's why I had the account. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to turn it over to Copeland. Sporting the Kelly green, but it's not quite the Kelly green. The not, not quite, yeah. It's a different color. I don't have that exact <coughs> color, but I do like it. That's what Are you a Notre Dame fan? Uh, not so much. Notre Dame's fine. But um, U of O used to wear more of Kelly green back in the oh, day. That's, okay. that's like what my uncle wore in the 80s when he gotcha. played offensive line for the Ducks. That was that okay. era and color. U of O pulled those uniforms back for the Pac-12 yeah. title game, for example. Kind of, they, they date those to 94, but the similar style was also in the 80s. So. Okay. I like their uniforms. All right, let's get this road on the show. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, those are beautiful. I agree. Sweet. 
witch piles. And all right then. Must get coffee or other beverage. Right. All right. Don, you good to resume? All right. Council, good to go? All right. Let us. We are back in session for part two of the work session for January 8, 2024. And we are now going to be going to our second topic, which is the Kaiser Work After Retirement Policy. And this goes so to Mr. Brown to lead off. Mr. Wood's going to be presenting this tonight. I just wanted to uh, lead off for him. This is uh, something the Oregon State Legislature extended for another 10 years past December 2024. So uh, we wanted to put this issue out in the public space and so we could, um, so you could begin to think about it and talk with constituents about it. And, um, we have done a lot of brainstorming as a staff and we'll give that to the end, um, but that's just our, our purpose for bringing it forward tonight. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, Madam Mayor, City Council. So we're going to be discussing the work after retirement policy, and I know that sounds really weird to think of people actually wanting to come back after they retire, um, but they, they do. It's amazing. Um, so to catch you up a little bit, um, back in July 2021, uh, the City Council adopted a policy at that point to allow employees to obtain normal retirement age under PERS statutes um, to retire and request to return to work in a limited duration position. Um, I've given you guys a, a copy of the policy um, all, along with the MOU Memorandum of Understanding with the KPA that you can, that's your, your parting gift that you can take home with you and, and review at your leisure. Um, but that was the policy that we came up with back in 2021. Um, and as I recall, it was a a little bit of a heated discussion back in the time because it is somewhat of a, a controversial topic. Um, really, you, you start bringing up the issues of the concept of double dipping. Um, even though the employees who retire and return back to work aren't being paid twice by the city of Kaiser, they are being paid by the state and then also by Kaiser at the same time. Um, so the, the double dipping idea comes into play and you know it's not super exciting for a lot of the, the general public. So it can be a controversial issue, so that's why we're bringing it to you now. Um, we're not expecting any kind of decision or guidance tonight. We just want to present it to you, and you can take this, and at a later date, we can come back after you've had an opportunity to receive feedback, and we can craft something that, that makes sense. Um, so under the, the retire, rehire policy, um, it lets employees uh, who are PERS eligible to retire to come back. Historically, um, PERS retired employees could do that all along. However, there was a limitation in the hours that they could actually work. So for tier one, tier two employees, they could come back to work and they could work 1,040 hours. For OPSERP, the, the third generation of tier uh, PERS employees, they could only work about 600 hours. Um, so th they could work those hours without impacting their retirement benefits. Under this legislation that the state passed, they could come back, work as much as they want to with no impact on their benefits. Um, so that's a, a benefit to the employee. To the employer, we're not required to remit the employee 6% uh, contribution. Um, that employee 6% contribution is paid by the city. So while we call it the employee piece, it's really the em employee pickup that's paid by the employer. Um, so we're not required to pay that, so for the people that stick around, we get a 6% cost savings over what we would have had to pay for them. Um, the employer PERS contribution, there is a second piece to PERS, and that's what the employer pays as far as the pension. Um, that piece is not used to calculate towards that specific employee's retirement anymore. That specific amount is now used to pay down the overall obligation that the city has. So we're paying for retirement benefits into the future. Um, instead of paying specifically for an employee, we're paying to pay down the city's unfunded obligation. So two key financial benefits, we don't have to pay a 6% employee pickup, plus the other 
employer piece is going to pay down our overall obligation. And hopefully that will result in lower contribution rates into the future. Um, so that's, that's the play. And unfortunately, with the way PERS is structured, it's one of the few benefits or few ways that we can actually pay down our obligation into the future outside of the, the um, contribution rates that are set every two years. Uh, so that, that's what we agreed to back a couple years ago. Um, so how did it work? Uh, as of January 4th, 2024, um, seven out of 18 eligible employees participated in the program. Um, so less than half. The city has saved almost 100,000 by not remitting the 6% employee per his contribution. Um, so that's 6% cash savings in our pockets. The city has paid 419,000 towards the overall employer pension obligation. At the time that we put this policy into place, the unfunded pension obligation was somewhere between 11 and 13 million. Um, so that's a, a significant pay down on, on that dollar amount. Um, unfortunately, the, the investment market has not been super great the last couple of years, so we have seen our obligation rise up to about 18 million. Um, so we're kind of going the wrong way, but it would be 18.5 million had we not had this program in place. Um, press pause. The, the pension market, that is not something that the city of Kaiser operates, but that's the state of Oregon. So the the less than stellar performance is not something that the city of Kaiser did, but was through the state PERS. Is that correct? That is correct. Just want to get that on the record. Thank you. You would not want me to be your investment manager, that's for sure. And we don't want to put you into that space when that is not your, uh, that's not the city of Kaiser's responsibility to operate the PERS pension fund. Okay. So overall, I would say the, the policy that we've had in place has been somewhat effective. Um, you know, we could have had better participation. However, you know, it is a, an elected benefit for employees. So uh, that's kind of where we're at as far as what's happened to date. So we come along this year, House Bill 2296 has extended the provisions of the Senate Bill 1049 by 10 years. So the state is saying, okay, this program that we had for a couple years, we're gonna push it out till 2034. Um, the way that we had written our city policies and also the MOU with the Kaiser Police Association, no matter what the state did, we said we're gonna stop, have a reset at December 31st, 2024. So we're getting towards that time and we wanna start the conversation sooner rather than later. Um, it's up to the city council really to decide whether we want to extend the retire rehire policy and if so, what some of the details of that policy should be. Um, so here's a, a chart, kind of shows you a little bit of where the cost savings is. Um, you can see that between the top chart and the bottom chart, there's one check mark missing. Um, that's really that 6% employee contribution. So that's where the savings comes in, the direct cash savings. Um, the other piece, as I'd mentioned before, is the employer contribution is paid, used to pay down the general obligation not to accrue additional benefits for any specific employee. So, so that's the, the financial aspect of how all this uh, works. So there's some pros and cons to this. Um, this policy allows us to retain experienced staff. Uh, this is especially important because majority of the folks impacted are the police department. Out of the seven people that have used this program, five of them were police. Uh, when we look into the future for the next couple of years, I believe there's 11 people that will be eligible over the next couple of years, and I believe nine of those are police. Maybe even 10 are, are police related. And this makes sense because the city itself only started with PERS on the administrative side, city hall side, in 2009. The police department has been with PERS since 1984. Um, so those folks are much more closer to the retirement age. They're also the tier one, tier two employees that this program is really designed to say, hey, why don't you think about retiring so we can stop paying you tier one, tier two kind of benefits. Um, so that, that's kind of what, what we're seeing there as far as a pro, we're able to retain the employees but not have all of the PERS obligations that go along with those. The con is, well, we're retaining some of our most expensive staff. Um, they're typically top step maximum benefit kind of folks. Um, so there is a cost associated with keeping those folks on for a couple of years. 
Um, also, along with that, there's additional accrual payouts upon final retirement. When someone retires with PERS, we have to do a, a complete settlement of all of their paid time off banks. Um, then when they're with us for a couple more years, those banks build up again and we have a second payout of some of those. Um, so that, that can be kind of a con when you start thinking about the financial impact. Um, also the public perception of the, the idea of double dipping. Um, that's going to be something that, that you folks will have to weigh with your, with your constituents. Um, from an internal standpoint, there is some concern about delays, promotional, special duty type of opportunities. If we're retaining some of the more experienced staff longer, that means some of the newer staff aren't getting the opportunities as quickly as, as some of them would like. Um, I just wanted to add something under the retaining the experienced staff. It's not only about retaining experienced staff, but if we look at uh, kind of our national growth trends and birth rates, this is a very practical problem that needs to be solved. There are not as many people in the workforce uh, that are coming into the workforce that are leaving it. So uh, very practically and very broadly speaking, we need the baby boomer generation to be in the workforce a little bit longer because of uh, there's just not bodies to replace them. So that's from a very global um, perspective, but it does come right down to this organization. We're fortunate. We have a good reputation. We don't have some of the recruitment challenges that a lot of other organizations do, but that is, it is a factor. Adding on, on top of that, specific to police departments as well, it's even more challenging to attract and retain police officers. So with this program being specifically you know, well, the police department having a lot of the, the folks that are able to take advantage of this program, it really impacts them a lot more than the rest of the city. So some questions at this point. Can, yeah, I've got a ton, but um, real quick, uh, Councilor Hussman. Mr. Wood, why is it that the police department was on PERS in 1984 and administrative staff did not get on PERS until 2009? What's the history there? Uh, by state statute, the police departments and fire departments are required to be PERS. Um, so that was really the driving factor why they had to be back in 1984. And the rest of the city just, I guess we were slow to come along. Okay, thank you. Well, I was going to go to Ms. DePina, if that's right with you, um, if there's some additional information since I think you were involved with some of this research. Um, yes, Mayor and Council. Shortly after I joined the city in 2008, uh, one of the recommendations we discussed as a leadership team was making sure that we had some um, equality in the retirement programs across the city. And that was at the point in time that we started the discussions with PERS to find out what it would take to transition the rest of the city to PERS. That was not a simple process, and it took us about a year to make happen. But that was, the motivation was to make sure that we were treating all of our employees um, similarly when it comes to retirement. Back when um, the police and fire were required to go to PERS, it was an option for other employees, but as long as we had at least a program that provided a certain level of retirement, we could remain with those programs, and that's what the city chose to do at that time. Awesome, thank you, Ms. Pina. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Kohler, do you have a question? Well, just to comment, we didn't have very many employees in 1984 either. True statement. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Wood? Okay. So some potential policy options is to consider as you think about um, this going into the future. There's a lot of options out there. Um, you've, you folks can take no action and let the existing work after retirement policy end December 31st, 2024. Um, you can modify the policies, duration or terms. Um, you could extend the policy to five, the full 10 years. Um, somewhere in somewhere in there, um, you could limit rehires to a limited duration. So if people say I want to come back, you can say, well, you get six months, a year, two years, something like that. Um, and that 
one of the benefits that we didn't throw in is this allows for um, a coordinated transition. If we have people in key positions, we know their retirement date you know, up to two years in advance now, as opposed to maybe a month or two weeks in advance um, without something like this. So there is that benefit as well. Um, we can also look at adjusting some of the, the benefits that are provided when people are rehired, such as limit the accrual caps and what unused paid time off benefits are paid out um, when they do finally retire. Um, so those are some of the things that you can take into consideration. We have reached out to some of our um, counterparts at different agencies, and it appears to be a wide range um, from folks not doing anything with this to people extending all the way out to 10 years, some not adjusting benefits, some adjusting benefits. Um, so it, there really is no consistent trend at this point that we're seeing. Um, we have a few more folks, a few more agencies to get back to us. Uh, but we're not really seeing a, a really super solid trend of this is what everyone is doing. The executive leadership team has gotten together and is making or getting ready to make a recommendation. Um, currently, we're saying let's extend it out for five years. Then we can revisit the policy at that point and see if, if what's going on still makes sense given the labor markets, given our financial position, that kind of a thing. Let's limit the rehire period to a maximum of two years. So when someone says, I want to re retire and come back, you get two years. That gives us an orderly transition period. Um, that is helpful, especially when you have positions that are difficult to fill or the candidate pool is, is difficult at a certain period of time. We're also recommending that we limit the accrual caps and the paid time off benefits um, to limit the large sum payouts at the end of a, a two-year rehire period. Um, so again, we want to have people come back, but want to have them use their paid time off instead of just accruing it to pay it out at the end. And that way, they're kind of forced to transition some of their responsibilities. So that's our current recommendation. Um, some of the next steps for you folks, um, we're requesting that you take some time to review the policy, uh, consider some of the implications, um, understand that the optics may not be super popular with the general public. Um, it also may not be popular with our internal staff, depending on which, which way we go. Um, the folks that are doing this, making use of this policy, do appreciate the, the opportunity to do that. Um, also give you folks a chance to ask any follow-up questions that you may have of city staff, um, clarifications on, on what a policy may look like. Um, obtain some feedback over the next couple of months or next month from your constituents, and we can come back at a later date and um, put some meat and potatoes to a policy if that's the direction you want to go. And with that, I would be willing to take any additional questions. All right. Let's start with some questions. Um, I put Councilor Reed on the spot last time, so I'll go to this end. And uh, Councilor Duran, do you have some questions laid off? And I will circle back. <clears throat> well, this, this last page answered one of my questions because I was wondering if we could limit the accrual and the payout. So that was something that you guys had talked about. What um, do you feel that that would negatively impact the people that would want to stay if we were limiting any of the benefits? Uh, p potentially. Um, obviously, if they have a, a program now that some folks are thinking, oh, I just want the same package that people got before, there could be a little bit of, of grief. Um, however, this is an optional optional opportunity. We're not requiring anyone to take advantage of this. So um, I do think we have some opportunities to construct a policy that makes sense for the city. Yeah, because that was my, that was one of the big things when we first started talking about this is seeing, you know, the lump sum. I know, at, at, you know, at my company, when I, when I have to do this, it sure hurts to write that big check at the end because it comes out of my pocket. But here it comes out of the city's. <laughs> so, um, yeah, th that was a, definitely something that I was concerned about, so I'm glad that you guys brought that up. Definitely a good concern. Thank you. Council President Starr. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so, Mr. Wood, you mentioned in your presentation that hopefully um, this would have a positive impact on future um, contribution rates in the form of a reduction. Um, is there a way that we can get an actuarial projection 
on what this could do to them? Because they feel like that's kind of a, a no fault of your own, right? I mean, it's PERS, but that's kind of a throw the dart at the dartboard with a blindfold on kind of thing. So is that something that an act it's that actuarially possible? And that was a big word for wow. me tonight. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think there's probably some ways that we could look at trying to model this. Um, I'm not an actuary either. Uh, they do have some models out there that we can try to enter some data into and see if that would come up with something. Because we haven't yeah. seen the positive impact on our reduction rate to date. It's only been, what, three years? Will have been three years? Correct. And yeah, I think it's going to be a, a challenge to, I'll see what I can do. I can't guarantee you anything, but I, I think there's some ways that we might be able to quantify something out of this. Uh, the challenge is we are fighting the investment returns every year, and with an assumed rate of I think it's seven points, seven point something at this point. Every time we don't necessarily hit that, our rates have an impact. And we're currently not projected to see a, the rates decrease for at least four to six years um, currently with the model. So what we're really doing is slowing the growth more than anything else at this point. Okay. Thank you. Follow up? Um, is there a rehire process? So if the if some if like say these eleven eligible people want to take advantage of this, is there a process they go through to do the rehire process? Like, I, I mean, what if it's not a two-way street? Councillor Starr, uh, that's an interesting topic and one of the other areas where what different jurisdictions are doing is across the board different. Um, our model from the current policy was we, we put a few items in the policy that says you're eligible if this, this, and this. So it referenced your performance uh, evaluation and what level of discipline, if any, uh, would make you eligible. There are um, a couple of uh, responding entities that actually do a, a formal recruitment process. We don't currently require that. Um, but we haven't had a situation, for example, in a couple of those places, they've limited to only three rehires. And so if you have two or three people who want to do it, then you have to select. So that's why they do a process. Um, the majority, however, are doing what we've been doing, and many of them, or some of them, are continuing to do that, as Tim said, up through 10 years, and that is if you're currently in the position and you're performing well and there's nothing in the policy that we pass that you have a problem with, you have that opportunity to make that request. Um, one of the things we talked about when we prepped this policy last time was making sure that we were equitable in providing it to any employee if that is our intent. And that's the way we wrote the policy that's in place right now. Great. We can, like we said, um, put some limits if we choose to on what we do for the future. Great. Thank you. Anything further? <laughs> Not at the moment. Right. Councilor Kohler. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm sure that the moment will come, Councilor Starr. <laughs> uh, for those that argue uh, against double dipping, uh, what's the difference between them hiring back on here and hiring somewhere else? And so, I mean, that's, that's my easy argument. But along with that, then I have another question. Do we, re do we rehire at the same pay and the same vacation and the same other benefits that we were paying them? In that... That might be something we have to look at. Sure, sure. That that is one of the the plays that we have to consider um, when we're retaining these folks. We typically hire them back at at whatever step they were currently at, so they typically are the top step. So you do have an opportunity if you say we're not going to play play this with this program. Um, 
when these folks retire, you are hiring typically more junior staff at a lower pay rate. So yeah, that is a balance to consider. Good question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have one of my clients that they end up with their employees that are there, have been there for 20 years, they end up with eight weeks of vacation a year. And if we have somebody that we're rehiring that are getting six or eight weeks of vacation a year, that's, that's a pretty hard pill to swallow. Oh. Uh, Ms. DePina, do you want to uh, respond on the benefits on the after returning? Certainly. Um, we do have some um, things we have to take into consideration with the passage of equal pay legislation. So it is, it would be very difficult for us to bring somebody back with 15 and 20 years of experience and not pay them at the top step. However, there is the room for some adjustment when it comes to the accruals and the usage and the payout. And so we're trying to take a measured approach to that where it makes uh, sense from an equity perspective to bring somebody back still earning, for example, vacation at the same level as when they went out, but we could put a control on that and say, you have a different cap than existing employees. So we're not taking away that time, but we're requiring them to actually use it and not have a big payout at the end. Right. Same use, thing with use sick it or leave. Lose it policy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and I, I feel better about that. Those are my questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Councillor Hussman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Ms. DePina, could you remind us what the retirement clocks are for various employees, just when, when in the career these are coming into play? Councillor Hussman, that is a very interesting question because it, it certainly depends on each employee. Um, there is a chart, I have to admit, I don't have it memorized, but um, the public service employees, police and fire, have an earlier uh, time that they can go out under full benefits than the rest of the employees. And there are different timelines for Tier 1 and Tier 2 and OPSER. Um, that said, what is more um, difficult to guess is what our individual employees' clocks are. Because we have employees that have been eligible to retire for years and choose not to. Uh, we have very few employees that are counting down the days until the moment that they can retire. So then it becomes a question of, for their family, for their life, for their situation, what makes the most sense for them. And I, you know, I keep track of what employees tell me they their plans are, but I can't tell you how many I've got on my little confidential sheet that says, may retire in the next six months to a year, and I keep moving it forward every year because they change their mind. Sure. Quick follow-up. Um, tier one, tier two is just based on date of hire, right? As far as when they were able to accrue PERS benefits based upon Correct. Uh, that saying, okay. Um, however, I would clarify that it's their date of hire in um, state or local government, not their date of hire with us. So if we hire a tier one employee from another entity, we now have that person as a tier one employee in our midst. Got it. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Councilor Reed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so a couple of my thoughts. First of all, I was thinking along the um, same lines of, um, as Councillor Kohler um, that this is not a, an unusual practice to retire and work someone else, somewhere else, especially among um, public employees. And I, I, I guess, too, just the, the, the term double dipping, they're, they're not double dipping. They're being paid by the city of Kaiser, and then they're being paid by PERS. So it, it, it's the criticism of double dipping isn't really accurate, right? I, I would concur. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that and uh, just kind of make sure I understood that. Thank you. Thank you. One one question I would have for um, Mr. Wood and Ms. DePina on the uh, benefits. I know for a lot of us uh, boomer types, and I resemble that remark. Uh, the, the motivation to keep on working had 
one common theme, and that is Medicare eligible because the cost of medical insurance prior to age 65 is, let's just say, prohibitive. And a number of folks hang on till they, till not just they, but their spouse, significant other, hit that magic age, and then it's sound our baby for a lot of folks. Um, so part of it is when people are eligible by years, but I think that we are hearing from many sectors, and uh, I'd like you to weigh in, that that health insurance issue is a significant one for the uh, retirement uh, plans for people. Um, so when we're looking at the rehire back, and this was on section four of the current policy on the benefits, are we looking at um, a range of options um, or from the leadership team on what we would offer folks, or are we looking to stay with, because it says here, health and dental insurance will be based on retiree rates with the city covering the same percentage cost as applicable to regular status employees in the same or comparable classifications. Is that the short way of saying it, they, they still get their health care benefits with the same copay that they used to have? That, that is correct, yes. Okay. That's what I need to know. That was a long way to say a short thing. Um, I do have one other um, question. You were talking about um, the balance between orderly turnover, promotional opportunity, and then the generational transition and so forth. So what I'm hearing from the recommendation from staff is to strike a balance there to ensure that we continue to have an orderly transition from one generation to the next without a wholesale exodus, but to not let, to not facilitate people remaining in place so, you know, for like full 10 years, where it's like, we really do need to facilitate a healthy turnover. Transition. Transitions. So is that, is, that, is that where the five years comes from? It's like, let's look at this, let's, and the two year, because the two years is what we're doing right now. So are you recommending that because what you're seeing right now is working? So from an individual employee standpoint, we're looking at retaining a two year period, mm -hmm. which is having the program available for five years. So that'll give us um, kind of a balance. We won't be revisiting this all the time. Yeah, we'll have a long enough period that we'll have some additional information to be able to come back and say, hey, this still makes sense or, or doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, however, it still provides with that two-year limit on an individual basis, the opportunity for a, uh, an organized transition as well as not retaining people forever. And then I've got one more question and that's on the collective bargaining agreements, uh, the terms regarding the benefits. So uh, the two union agreements we have right now, uh, they're good with the current setup. So if we are looking at um, and making any changes, well, that, that will also have to go to an MOU with our two unions, correct? I'll speak to that one, um, Mayor Clark. We only have one MOU at this memorandum of agreement at this time with Kaiser Police Association. I presented the information to the other union and they saw no reason to worry about an MOU. Um, so, but you are correct that if we change the policy, revise it, do whatever, we will need to establish another, and I would again reach out to the other union. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councilor Duran, do you had a question? Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, I was thinking about, you know, we got budget coming up. Is Could we put together a, um, a budget on keeping people at the same rate of pay, at, like we're talking about, and what it would be if, the retirees left and we brought in employees at a lower rate of pay, what that would do to the impact on our budget over the next few years, because just a hypothetical. Because, you know, if I could see a huge cost savings in allowing people to, to move on and bring in new people in at a lower rate, you know, maybe I'd be inclined to, to look that direction. Um, so that, that's just, just thinking budget. Sure, I, I could take a swing at that. There's going to be a lot of assumptions that I'm going to have to yeah, make. I'd so imagine, but don't hold me accountable to it. <laughs> but I would, I would agree, uh, Councillor Duran, that some modeling, and that's what went into our initial decision 
to adopt this policy a couple of years ago was exactly that. We were looking at the cost benefit to our general fund as well as the benefit to our um, employees. But there was a, a, and we saw clearly there was some cost savings at $100,000 in what we uh, didn't pay into um, the PERS accrual. And anything that can help our general fund uh, with the PERS liability. And I just uh, want to follow up. There was a comment made earlier that uh, the other thing about the contrib I love the word, contribution rates. It sounds like it's optional. <laughs> it's not. The contribution rates, and for people who are just listening to the audio, yes, that's air quotes, are set by the state, and they are not optional. They are required, and they come straight out of our general fund. So it's an underfunded mandate that takes from the general fund, which is parks, planning, police, it's the basic services, and that's where this money is going to come out, and we don't get a chance to say, hmm, I'm not feeling it, or, you know, I'd rather spend that someplace else. Um, there, there is no negotiation on that. that. That is a requirement, so I think it's really important to keep in mind that um, our finance staff, our HR staff, has been looking at options that give us some flexibility to save something in our general fund as uh, the PERS um, wave continues to move through. And I know it's primarily tier one, tier two. Um, OPSERP doesn't have the same structure. It doesn't have the same requirements. Um, it's a, Mr. Pina, I always get this wrong. One's a guaranteed benefit. The other one is a guaranteed contribution. Okay. So I just want to get that one out there. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Brown. Um, thanks, uh, Madam Mayor and Council. The, I, I want to express appreciation to the executive leadership team for thinking this through very carefully and having lots of discussion about it. And we have um, this option of keeping the retirees and rehiring them is, is a balance, balancing act because it's a forced discipline and it's a, we're f forcing ourselves to pay down that UAL by that same contribution rate, which is approaching 30%. We're paying towards the UAL when the other alternative is, well, we don't have to pay that, um, that rate towards the UAL. We can get somebody new and have a new obligation, but it, so it's, it's less money now and that's the hard part to balance is we need the money now, definitely. But paying down that unfunded accrued liability is also important. So that's why there's a limited duration. And we can get within a pretty good ballpark on uh, with our own modeling and some tools the state has. I think that's partly why uh, this came back with the legislature because this has been benefiting some jurisdictions and they wanted to be able to extend that benefit for the general funds, <coughs> excuse me, um, over a longer period of time because the tier one, tier two it, tsunami is still not finished yet and uh, needing to ride it out to the, the end of that wave when we stop seeing the increase in tier one, tier two retirees. And I think that's what uh, approximately 2032-ish, heavy on the ish. Okay, I'm gonna head nod. That seems about right. Okay, I seem to recall that from a work session in the past. So any other uh, questions for tonight? And then, oh, Mr. Johnson, did you have something? Yes, it's not on this topic or? Oh yes. So. Uh, I want to wrap this one up and then we'll go to Mr. Johnson. Um, the next step, so you were asking us to um, come and talk to staff members um, with additional questions, concerns, ideas. Um, so I would encourage counselors to please reach out to um, our, our staff leadership team to make sure that if you have any additional questions, a thought popped up um, in the middle of the night that you can get that answer. Don't call them in the middle of the night. Sorry, sorry, Dan. <laughs> Kelser Kohler. Um, make, make a little memo. Uh, but then the plan is to come back in um, either work session or did you want to bring this policy forward um, consideration and adoption in about a month? 
uh, based on what feedback you get from council? What's the plan? Yeah, we want to gauge it based on the feedback we get from you. So um, please talk with uh, the people um, in your circles because all your circles are different and we want to hear the broad range of feedback that each of you have so that we can craft something that would be acceptable. Okay, and again, not among ourselves because serial meetings would be a really bad idea and they're really illegal. Uh, so please reach out to uh, staff members uh, with your thoughts, concerns, ideas, and so forth, and then they will compile to bring this back to us at a later date. If there's a need for another work session, we will do that. Otherwise, we'll see a revised version of the uh, recommended policy. We'll come to city council at a city council regular session near you. All right, so we will put a bow on this, uh, this topic at the moment. Mr. Johnson, you want to um, bring some information to us tonight on another topic? Yes, Madam Mayor, if I may, and I know we don't have other business under the work session, but I, I wanted to clarify a statement I made at the last meeting regarding the, the name of the community rooms change um, and apologize if there was any misunderstanding in that statement. There was a very brief item in the Kaiser Times about it. Council President Starr had stated that there was consensus by council on the name change uh, in the work session we had on that topic, and that's accurate. Um, I stated that there was consensus at the work session, but I also stated that there did not appear to be much discussion or consensus at the regular meeting where the actual resolution, the first resolution was adopted, and therefore, since we wanted to be sure about it when we came back, and we had to correct the resolution anyway, uh, when we came back, we wanted to put that in there and make sure council was aware of that. So I, I indicated that. Unfortunately, the newspapers and perhaps some others kind of misunderstood my intent and took it as contradicting council president Starr, and that certainly was not my intent. Uh, I actually agreed with her that there was pretty clear consensus at the work session about that topic. And so um, the news, newspaper kind of truncated that a bit and it made it appear that I was contradicting uh, Council President Starr, and again, that was not my intent. So I would apologize to Council President Starr and any others who might have misunderstood my intent on that. So I apologize for that. Thank you. Council President Starr? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I don't think any apologies were needed um, on your part, but I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Is there anything else for the good of the order this evening? Thank you all for a very productive session. The time is 7.55, and we are adjourned.